In today's episode of the Shane Holmes podcast, one of the largest real estate influencers, Ricky Carruth, shares how he built a massive following while selling more than 100 homes per year. And if you love selling real estate as much as I do, then this one's for you. So I get in when I'm 20 yeah. years old. It's 2002. 90% of people fail. I'm like, yeah, but 10% succeed. That's what all the brokers told me. I went and interviewed and none of them really wanted me. All through my entire life, basically everybody always said I couldn't do whatever it was I was trying to do. And it's like this right here. It's everything that I've done happened really slow. And what I do is nothing special. Like every single person can do what I do. And the problem is people Welcome back to the Shane Holmes podcast. Today we have Ricky Carruth. Ricky is a legend, 22 years in the business, over 100,000 YouTube subscribers, 250K on Instagram, and just a wealth of knowledge. Thanks for coming out. Appreciate yeah, you. Yeah, man, absolutely. I've been looking forward to this for a while. Yeah, I mean, I was like, I'm going to LA. Let me hit Shane up. Yeah, let's do it. Let's jump right into it, bro. So a lot of people look up to you in the real estate space. How long have you been in the business for now? Mm, yeah. 22 years. 22 yeah, years. 22, over two decades. Yeah. And so you yeah. started just head down, selling, selling, selling. Yeah. And uh, you, how long did it take you to get to doing like 100 homes a year? 17 years. Well, no, no, no. That was a million bucks. It took me, let's see, 12 years, right? Mm -hmm. So so I get in when I'm 20, 20 yeah. years old. It's 2002. And uh, everybody was like, you're too young. Yeah. You know, you're too young to do this. Everybody, 90% uh, of people fail. I'm like, yeah, but 10% succeed. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm yeah. Like, like, do you know 90% of people? That's what all the brokers told me. Mm -hmm. They were like, you actually, I got turned down by a bunch of brokers, right? I went and interviewed and none of them really wanted me because I was 20. And uh, I was like, okay. Um, I love it when like all through my entire life, basically everybody always said i couldn't do whatever it was i was trying to do you know i remember i was a sophomore in high school and i or a freshman i was a freshman i weighed myself at my buddy's house and i was 150 pounds and everybody else was you know whatever mm -hmm. a buck 20 or something i was like i'm gonna play football and everybody's like no not gonna happen no i was all county I had a full paid scholarship football scholarship um you know every little thing that i did everybody doubted me and it's like this right here um, like some of the biggest influencers in the real estate business world, they probably saw me come on the scene and were like, okay, here's another, here's one of another these guys. Yeah. To, he'll yeah. be here for, you know, he'll be here for six months or a year or whatever. But now, you know, they can't, you they're can't just like, okay, he, he's not, he's not going anywhere. <laughs> yeah. We might as well make friends with him. Yeah. But, um, same thing in real estate. So it's like, whatever I decide that I want to accomplish, or whatever I'm in on, I'm all in on it. Yeah. Right. And I'm focused on that one thing, whatever that one thing is. So mm -hmm. throughout my entire life, everything that I've done has been just one thing at a time. I'm not really doing a bunch of multiple things. You know, there's one main thing that I'm really trying to accomplish. Go all in on. Yeah. And between 2002 and, you know, basically 2022, that's when I stepped out of production. Um, I was really focused on just being the very best agent like everything i want i do i want to be the best in the world at it mm -hmm. that's the way i look at it and in, and in today's landscape you can actually quantify that with the way social media is you can literally see what the best people in whatever your field is are doing what the results are and and you you kind of have a a baseline you know to to really lean on yeah you can um, you can look at the analytics of how many real views are they getting and what their follower count is well what their what their results are you know what their business results are yeah you know and how they're actually accomplishing it mm -hmm. a lot of that stuff's out on front street now so you actually you 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 really you know it's, it's it's like you know i was the number one agent in my market for eight years in a row um so i can go out and teach people how to be the number one agent in their market because i did it yeah and um you know one of the things that i tell agents to do and it's kind of messed up actually but one thing i really you know harp on is if you want to be number one in your market look in your mls and find the number one agent right and and learn everything about study their business on M in mls mm -hmm. know how many listings they have how many pendings how many were buyers versus sellers how many listings they pick up a month what type of listings are these 
um, you can learn a lot right there. And, and it, it literally gives you the blueprint, right? You've got to beat that to be number one. You don't be number one. You got to beat number one. Yeah. Well, here's all the data on number one. And now, you know, you, you know, you, you can see if they, what they do on social, you know, and try to, you can really pick up a lot and actually put together <laughs> a plan to go out there and accomplish same thing with anything. I mean, you look yeah. at the Gary V's and the Grant Cardone's and, um, some of the biggest, you know, even the Elon Musk's and the, the, all these people, literally, you can see what they've got going on, what the results are. And if you've got some kind of massive target, you can easily put that game plan together yeah. to go out there and literally do anything you want to do. Yeah, right? I, I literally, when we first started talking, probably, what, a year ago or something like that, I looked at, okay, how often is Ricky posting? Mm -hmm. What is he posting? How is he scaling this out? And one thing that really stood out to me that you talked about earlier is that really successful pe people, they kind of pick that one thing and you're kind of sick enough in the head to like, when someone tells you that you're not going to do it or that yeah. it's, it's impossible, it, it almost pushes you more instead of mm -hmm. kicking you back. Yeah. And that I definitely see in you. I can I've hear that coming through. I've always on my shoulder because nobody ever thinks I can do what I tell them I'm going to do. <laughs> yeah. And then I do it every single time. Every single time. Right? I love that. People used to, people, people lose bets on me constantly. Yeah. You know, but what's so funny is, is everything that I've done happened really slow. It wasn't, it, it, nothing happened really fast. Mm -hmm. It literally, and, it, and what I do is nothing special. Like every single person can do what I do. And the problem is people care what other people think too much, right? Yeah. They, don't, they don't make the calls because they're worried about what the person they're calling is going to think or, or what even other people are going to think about them making the calls or they don't post the video because they're worried about what their friends and family or what other people that they don't even know yeah. is going to think yeah. about it. And it holds them back. Newsflash, nobody cares, number one. Yeah, you're not that important. But number <laughs> two, like who cares what they think? Yeah, <laughs> you yeah. Know, number number two but i don't know it, it, it's crazy man it's crazy because like to succeed in anything is not rocket science or something unachievable or something you got something that you get lucky at mm -hmm. it's something that every single person can do yeah if they'll just do the little things there's a guy named jeff olson you know him mm -mm. he wrote the book the slight edge and um dude is a he's a baller Right. This guy is a baller. And he was one of the original OGs of personal development back in the 90s. Um, he had this uh, network called the People's Network. And he had Jim Rohn, like all like um, who's the guy, the most inspirational speaker in the world. Um, not Eric Thomas, but the guy before him. Anthony Robbins. No, no. Now, now, Tony, he was he was friends with Tony. Tony was never part of the People's Network, but Darren Hardy and like all the OGs of the personal development world um, were on the People's Network, which was his. And um, anyway, this guy wrote The Slight Edge, which is my favorite all time book. I read it three times and it's it's the way that he illustrates this is just it, it's masterful. But he uh, the premise is that like these little things that don't matter end up being the reason why you have this massive success right um and it's so funny because those those things in the moment like for example like you know if a real estate agents makes their calls today their business doesn't like not gonna it, change yeah it doesn't change like today yeah right or eating a hamburger right or something like you you, know, you don't look differently from eating a hamburger but if you do it every day for a year you look a lot different drastically yeah same thing with with business, you know, those little things, posting a video every day, making your calls every day, the things that don't matter in the moment yeah. is what actually matters for, you know, for your success. Longevity. And it's crazy because when you make the decision not to do it, it didn't really affect you mm -hmm. right then. If you make the decision to do it, it doesn't affect you. You made a decision not to do it. So it's so insignificant in the moment, right? But the moment is all you have. You don't have the, the past. You don't have the future. You don't have any of that. All that is so far away out of your reach. All you have is this moment right here yeah. to take advantage of and do the things that you know are going to add up to be massive. And that's all it's been, man, is just my whole life is basically a slight edge, you know? Yeah. I remember when I, when I was talking to uh, Ryan Pineda, that also kind of kicked up my desire to really start going all in on, on 
the filming and stuff, you got to be willing to do it for a year and just not really care what comes from it. Like if you're not willing to just put your head down, start post consistently and pick your head up in six months, don't even start. Don't even, don't yeah. even, because if you do that one day of posting a video and then you just kind of fall off, it's like same thing like eating a cheeseburger. You yeah. can do it and no one's going to, it's not going to move the needle yeah. at all. Yeah, no, Alex Ramosi, he he said that uh, when he when he decided to do YouTube and he had his YouTube guy, you know, that was going to edit and, you know, whatever, consult him and stuff. He basically committed to a decade. Like, let's do this for a decade and then we'll, we'll kind of see what happens out of I this. I love that. And um, that's really the way you have to be with anything. You know, it's almost like you need to commit to it. Like, this is your new life. So many people go into stuff with the, these expectations and you know when it doesn't look achievable after like three months they give up it's like you haven't even begun <laughs> yeah, the journey yet. yet you haven't yeah. even started yet um there speaking of jeff olson he he did a study in his company and um with with his sales guys and all kinds of different um partners and stuff and the study was pretty remarkable and, and what it said was is that whatever goal you want to achieve, let's say you want to, you know, let's just say, for example, you want to make a million dollars a year within five years, let's say, right? He said that halfway through to your goal, you'll be about 18% there. Halfway through 50%. So like in that, in that instance, for to make a million dollars in five years, two and a half years in, you're making 180,000 a year. That's a really good way to look right? at it. You're making 180,000 a year and it, and it like escalates because it's it, it's it's the compounding of your efforts, right? And yeah. and it's a curve, right? That's that's the slight edge is is is, is it's like this and then it, it's a curve that and it kicks, that yeah. slopes up. Um and it was funny because, you know, as I was interviewing him, you know, we we hung out for a while and and I interviewed him and I'm going to be on his podcast in a couple of weeks. And I said that's funny because I've been at um YouTube for like seven years, you know, I'm at a, I just hit a hundred thousand subscribers. He's like, well, where were you three and a half years in? I was like 19,000. It was literally, it was literally 18%, right? Halfway there, you know, um, it just goes to show you. So like in the beginning of anything that you do, you don't see a lot of movement. There's not a lot of like success, a lot of results. And that's what, that's what crushes people is because they can't see it. It's not tangible to them. So they start to doubt the process and they start to back up and say, let me reevaluate. Let me go try something else. Yeah. When all the time this, this was working. Yeah. You, you got to start the curve you, over. Yeah, you don't even realize how much you're crushing it. Yeah. A lot, a lot of these people that quit, like quit real estate and quit social and all this stuff, they're actually killing it. They don't even know it because they're comparing themselves to other people who've been doing it for 10 years, they're on month three and they're comparing themselves to somebody who's been doing it for five or 10 years. It's like, you, that's not even, you, that's not even apples to apples. That's not, that's, that's not even oranges to apple. That's nothing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, in today's world, all this instant gratification and stuff, you know, comparing ourselves to other people, worried about what other people think, you got to let that go. And it's harder and harder and harder to do because, of the way the internet is we see everything yeah and so it's really hard to do and i get it um but if anything you know you you just got to understand what i'm saying about how long this stuff really takes and use the other people not as a crutch to say oh i'm not killing it or i'm not succeeding but almost inspiration right to keep going like this is where i could be if i don't stop mm -hmm. so yeah that i mean it <laughs> It's, it's a wild, it's like, it, it is like the wild, wild west. It really right? is. It, I mean, it's it just really like a free like, for all. You're you just know? going after it and, and, and posting and, and door knocking and just pick your head up after a while. And you're like, oh, before Facebook changed their ads and stuff, you know, it was the wild, wild west. You could literally create an audience of anything you wanted. Now, now it's so regulated yeah, you know, they because it of back the so regulations much. and everything, you know, when they started to. You know, everything started to end up in court and before the Supreme Court and stuff like that. Um, but you could literally do anything you wanted to do. That's like in Canada, there's uh, a lot of uh, cold calling laws that are really strict. Like you, you get fined, you know, like you got to be careful with certain things up there. Not like here, 
you know, and, and my thoughts are that it, the way things are going, will eventually get there where there's, there actually are, you know, right now, like the DNC and all this stuff, it's almost like, it's almost non-existent and, and it, you know, the lawyers use it to, to go after, you know, Keller Williams that paid out a $40 million, you know, settlement on DNC stuff. Um, you know, EXP paid out a big settlement. Um, you know, there have been brokerages. I don't, I don't know if Remax did, but like, it's like those lawsuits with the commissions, like they're going after the big guys that can pay out tens of millions of dollars. You know, it, it's just a paycheck for these guys and they manipulate the situation to line up with what their class action agenda is to make these big payouts and, and good for them. Um, but I think eventually what will happen is same thing that's going to happen with buyer agent commission. Like there's going to be some big changes with that because of all this. And, um, honestly, I think that's going to bring it back more to the wild, wild west because before we had, you know, the, the cooperative compensation rule and you had to offer a buyer agent commission on to, to put your property in MLS. Um, it was the wild, wild west because buyers had to pay their own fee basically. And so they were having to go directly to the listing agent most of the time who were, who's looking out for the seller. Right. And it, you know, there's a lot of weird stuff that goes on when you have those kind of circumstances where the buyer's not represented. Yeah. And like we're going, we're reverting back to that. It's getting there. That, that's, that's like the direction we're going in, you know, that I feel like we'll get there. Who knows if it actually happens or not? You know, this is a weird year. We got yeah. election year. There's no tell on how everything's going to play out. But, um, and a lot of people kind of freak out about the buyer agent commission disappearing. It's and not going to disappear. I mean, the thing is, is, and a lot of people are like, oh, I'm going to go be a listing agent now because of all this. It's like, yeah, you should anyway. You, yeah, you should right? be doing that from you, inception. You should be anyway. But, 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 but wait a minute. Like the thing is, is in the future, if things go the way that the general public doesn't, they want, but they don't know they don't want. They don't want that. But, but, yeah. but, but that's the, what they want. That's what they say they want now. Um, if it goes that direction every single buyer that you show to is going to have signed a contract and to pay you. And if not already have paid you through a, through a retainer, like you're only going to show property if you've been paid or you know that you're going to get paid yeah. to show that property. Um, right now you take every buyer that, that comes across your desk, you work for them for free, hoping that they buy something and you get paid out of the out of the sales price. Yeah, yeah. That's not going to be the case in the future. Buyers are going to sign a contract just like a list, just like a seller does to list a property that says they're going to yeah. pay you. So I'm not going to like, I may revert. I may start teaching on being a buyer, you know, like, I mean, that sounds good to me. Let me get paid to show properties. Like it's yeah. going to be great. And if this, if the buyer doesn't move forward with that, if they want to go directly to the listing agent, great. Go do that. I don't have to show property now. I can spend my time with something that's making money. Yeah. I, I recently, not, re, not super recently, over the past couple of years, I now only show property with a buyer broker agreement. If yeah. you want to go look at a house, I will not go unless you are signed under a buyer broker agreement because every agent that's watching this has been burned. They've showed 10 houses and then got sidestepped, another agent represented them, their friend was an agent and they felt bad for whatever you got used for the showing. So I don't think that's as horrible as a thing that people, are, as people are making it out to be. No, no. I mean, you know, like for me, it's going to be, you know, like for, like for the, in, my opinion for, for the industry is it's going to be fine. I don't think it's going to really change a whole lot of, of, of anything. In the well, end of the I think day. what'll happen is I think the big change that's going to happen is going to be, they're going to remove that field from MLS. That's what I think is going to happen. There's not going to be a place to put, this is how much we're paying the buyer agent. Mm -hmm. It's just not going to exist. They're going to erase that field. And, uh, and so that, that, that'll be a big change. Like, yeah. Like, right. So, so there will be some big changes. There will be a lot of differences in the way we operate and everything. Um, and I think it'll scare a lot of agents out of the business. Um, and it will, I think it will affect agents that are not confident in pitching their skill set. Like, yeah, I mean, you're going to have to sit down with a buyer the way that you sit down with a seller. Now, a lot of reason why, you know, agents don't do listings because they're scared to have that conversation. Why? I don't know. I have no, or, I mean, why are you an, either. why are you a real estate agent? Yeah. 
You know, I mean, your, your job is, is to sit down, learn what people want to do, you know, consult them, sign a contract to work with you and, you know, execute and give them great service. Um, but the way the industry has went over the last 30, 40 years um, has been a direction where we don't have to do that. Um, especially for buyers, we can just take them and put them help in a them. car and go waste your time. Yeah. And it, <laughs> yeah. May, it, it, it has breeded the, this, this generation of agents who don't have to have those conversations, don't have to sit down and consult and, you know, explain contract and have somebody sign it. So it's created this breed of agents that, you know, frankly, it's kind of weak. Yeah. Um, so I, th I think that they'll, that, that group of agents will either say, this is too hard. This is scary. This is whatever. And leave the business. Um, or they'll develop the skills they need to, to go out there and help people buy and sell real estate. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Like it's nuts. It's so funny. Cause every time I bring up a buyer brokers agreement to a buyer, it's, they've never heard of it before. They've never in their life been asked to sell one. Yeah. And I just kindly explained to them that I have a business that I run. This is how I operate. I need to ensure that our relationship is exclusive. Well, it's good because it explains because a lot of buyers, they'll work, they'll, they'll, they'll like an agent will show them property and then they'll go have another agent show them other houses. Ten other houses. Or, yeah, yeah. Or they'll go to, straight to a builder and or, or whatever. And it wasn't because they were trying to screw the original agent over. It's literally because they didn't uh, they didn't know they, they didn't, didn't know talk. they were screwed up. They didn't over. have that they, did, they didn't even realize how you know what the process really is. They had no idea. Um, and so I think it's a good thing. There's going to be more transparency around exactly what the process is. I think the consumers are going to be more well educated. Yeah. I think I think the downfall is going to be. The buyers who either don't want to or refuse to pay for representation, who go out and go directly to the listing agent and aren't don't have any representation, and now they're up against somebody who's a seasoned pro looking out for the other guy, yeah. looking out for the seller. I don't think that's that's a good thing, but it's their choice. Um, you know, as a listing agent in that scenario in that world. Right. If that if that world comes true, when a buyer comes to me um, directly as the listing agent, I'm like, listen, I suggest, you know, advising you to go get your own representation. OK, because I can write the contract for you and it's going to cost you this much if I do that. Right. I'm going to I'm going to charge you this this I'll charge you a flat fee or something. But if I'm writing the contract for you, I'm charging you a fee for that. Yeah. Number one. Number two, I'm only looking out for the seller. Just so you know, I'm going to be trying to get my guy the, the, the highest price. Mm -hmm. I'm not looking out for you. Just mm -hmm. so you know, right? If you want to move forward with that scenario or you pay me X to write the contract, knowing that I'm going to try to be getting the highest price, sign here that I went over all this with you and, and I'll write the contract and we'll, we'll get the deal worked out. Yeah, it's um, always a really weird dance. Like I, I represent both on a good number of properties and... If you're not working with someone who has a lot of experience doing that specifically, it, it really is a dance. You got to be able to take your hat off, stand over here, talk to this guy, lower your guard, be transparent, put your hat back on, go back over here. And if you're working with someone that hasn't done that a bunch of times, that isn't necessarily good at it, you're going to get burned. It's very, you mean, very you mean easy. if a buyer works with an agent who is not real experienced working both sides? Yeah, like if someone that hasn't been in the business for a long time that is strictly looking to pop the biggest money they can, you can get hurt in that in that situation for sure. Oh, like you said. Yeah. No, absolutely. That's why I say, like, it's gonna be a little bit of a mess in the beginning. Um the uh the the the, the fact is is that or this is why I think it would play out, you know, if they said, Okay, here's we're drawing the line in the sand. No more buyer agent commission on MLS. Um, I think I think in that moment, because buyers are so used to the way it is now, I think at that time, I think you'll still have about twenty percent or so of buyers who 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 pay for their own representation. Mm -hmm. So I think you're going to have eighty percent initially who 
don't want to they're like i'll go straight to the listing agent i don't need representation yeah. they're they, the, the the buyer agent isn't doing anything for me anyway i, I find all my homes on zillow i don't need <laughs> yeah. i don't need a, i don't need an agent yeah. right and so and so 80 percent says i'll go represent myself basically it's the same thing as saying i'm going to go into the court of law without a lawyer yeah, i'm going to represent gonna rep myself yeah, it's exactly the same and so 80 percent, i think i think this is my theory that 80 percent will go out and try to represent their self and I think after about five years, I think every year we'll see a bigger percentage of buyers who do pay for representation because because those because we're going to see buyers, we're going to see all kinds of problems happen. Buyers are going to go out there and realize, wait a minute, I do. There's all this stuff I didn't know about I, that I need somebody on my side representing my best interest. And so I think it's going to reverse, and it's going to go to eighty percent of buyers pay for their representation over time. Right? Initially, the shock. It's like, I don't need a buyer agent, but over time, three, four, five, six, seven, eight years, I think it'll slowly, the pendulum will actually swing over to our 80%. And so that's going to be, that's going to be the big moment for, for, I think agents leaving the business too. Cause that initial shock of, whoa, 80% of buyers, basically that buyer agent commission is gone Done. and the 20% that's there, we got to ask for it. Yeah. And so they're going to be freaked out. They're going to leave the business. And then over time, the agents that are actually agents who understand the process and how to go out there and speak to consumers and, you know, negotiate contracts and, you know, explain agency and representation. They're going to crush. It. Yeah. It's going to be good for, for it's going to be gonna, good you're gonna, if you're good. What's going to happen is you're going to develop all this, this, this core group of, of client of buyer clients who are happy to pay you for your, for your services you know, you're just, you're going to build this list that your, your database of buyers who are willing to pay for representation and are loyal to you. I mean, then you just got buyers, you know, you got this group of buyers who are paying you to do this stuff. You got this group of sellers that are paying you to do this stuff. And it's, it's a different business than what it is today. Mm -hmm. Um, but it, it is what it is. Yeah. That's the direction we're going in. You got to adapt and you got to, you got to look at the new rules and say, okay, these are the new rules. Let me go out here and show them how to crush it. Yeah. I think also that the amount of litigation that's going to happen during that initial five years where the agent commission gets cut out is going to skyrocket. I think so too. Yeah. I mean, I've heard that, um, you know, that the, that the buyers who feel like they got shunned, who are going to want to retaliate in court. Um, I think there's some truth to that. You know, I don't, I don't know how, I'm not convinced that it's going to be like this huge ordeal, um, but it could be. You yeah. Know? Yeah. I think something that really stuck out to me earlier is that I haven't been able to stop thinking about is how exponential things are. Mm. Like I almost left the business altogether after being two years in. I started, I started like you, I started when I was 20 years old. Exactly. And I had a, a, a pretty bad mentor in the first two, I think my first year in real estate, I might have made twenty to thirty thousand dollars. Yeah, maybe. me too. I made twenty thousand dollars my yeah. first year. Yeah, and I was wash, I was managing a car collection for this A list celebrity guy, basically just washing cars to pay my bills in between commission checks. Yeah. Year two comes, I find a good mentor, start making a little bit more money. I think I made maybe fifty, sixty grand, and then you get to like year five, and I'm twenty five years old, having never gone to college and the growth without saying what the actual exact number is, it just happens so fast. Yeah. So if you can, if you can stomach yeah. that, that first few years and, and put your head down and hit that curve, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's where the magic starts to yeah. happen. And, it, and I hate seeing people that are so personable to have so much skill, but just don't have that stomach yeah. to get through there. Cause yep. they're just losing out on so much. Yeah. They contemplate what to do, so they waste time thinking about what to do, um, you know, and then they're scared to do it. So then they hide behind other other things, you know, so they don't have to do the things that actually move the needle. Yeah. Um, and, and then you'll you'll see the agents that are literally crushing it, you know, like they built this database to 500 people. They've they've closed, you know, let's just say like, you know, six, seven properties, you know, really like the building this foundation of something that could be a million dollar business. Um, and they're just like, so discouraged they quit and you're right. It's, it's stomaching it. 
uh, those emotional ups and downs. Because again, expectations, people come up with these expectations that oh, I'm in real estate, I'm my own boss, I make my own money, I set my own hours, this is sky's the limit, this is crazy, this is a great opportunity. You know, they're just on fire when they come in. And then after a couple of weeks, they kind of like start to lose the fire yeah. and they start to realize, wait a minute, there's this mountain of knowledge I'll never learn in a day, you know? And then after three months of really grinding their face off because they're so ambitious and they want it so bad and they just hit it with everything they got, but they don't sell anything, you know? And it's, they're three months in with not even a sell in sight. And they're there. Then they start becoming disappointed, frustrated, um, and that, that's the point where a lot of people give up. But the future top producers, they take that moment and they say, okay, like this is harder than I thought. Yeah. <laughs> right. But Ricky did it. Shane did it. You know, there's all these people that I look at and I'm like, there's no way that if they did it, I can't do it. Right. It's harder than I thought. I don't care. I'm going to, I'm going to pick up the pieces and I'm going to, I'm going to get back on the horse. And what happens is, is they have this really high expectation. Then they have this really low, low. Right. Then when they get back on the horse, here's their expectations again. Right. But it's not as high of expectations as the original one. And then they have another low, but it's not as low as that original low because they kind of knew it was coming. That's interesting. That's right. Very and, and, and so what happens is, is there's these big swings, these big emotional swings. Like the first one is massive. <laughs> yeah. Right. And then the second one is not as massive, but it but it, it's there. It still gets and you. then the third one and you get to where it levels out. Right. And it takes a long time. It takes six months, 12 months, 18 months, 24 months to really get to, to handle your emotions behind the expectations and the ups and downs and all those unexpected twists and turns that happen. Um, you know, losing deals is devastating to a new agent because it's like you work so hard. This is the moment. This is the deal. Yeah, this is that you know, one. this yeah. is the one that's going to happen. And then it doesn't happen. Yeah. And, and it's like somebody ripped you, the heart your soul out of your body, um, you know, and it's devastating. So it, it, but it, 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 what's so funny about that is that every single agent, regardless of how successful they are now, I mean, like Ryan Serhant, Joss Altman, you know, Jordan Cohen, my, everybody, not a single one of them didn't have the same exact path that I'm saying. Right. So it, it is. So, my message to agents is like, if you're frustrated, if you're disappointed, if you're going through this, good. It's the Not same necessary. path everybody everybody else that's amazingly successful went through. So you must be on the right track yeah. if you're feeling these emotions. Yeah. You know, you're on the right track. Keep going. Yeah. You know, like you're right around the corner from this exponential spike. Yep. Now you might be two or three years out from that spike. And when you're in that two or three years, it feels like eternity. But when you get there, it's here. Yeah, yeah. Right? And I wish I could say that those, those undulations stop. But even, even when you get to becoming that top producer where you're making over a million dollars a year, it's still going to happen. You're, so just get used yeah. to it. Because I just, I mean, I could say over the past two months, I've probably had $100,000 in deals just... Go like yeah, that. You yeah. get screwed. You get burned. Things change. Well, you learn. You learn when to get excited about a deal. Over time, your experience helps you learn when to be excited about a deal, and 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 when to be disappointed, and when not to be excited, and when not to be disappointed. Yeah. You know, like you get to where you see these big deals come in, or maybe you have stuff under contract, but you know. Cause this happened before yeah, you're like, that this deal could fall through, <laughs> yeah. you know, in the beginning, you're counting your money, right? <laughs> yeah, in the beginning, like you got a commission, you know, it's going to be 30 grand. You're already, you already know what you're going to spend that money on before it closes. Yeah. Right. You already got that money spent. And, um, you know, five, 10 years in you have, you have something pending for 30 G's. You're like, okay, you're, we'll like, you're like, all right, we'll see if it goes through. Yeah, you know yeah. what I'm saying? That's money. But, I, yeah. I love what you said too. Like, I remember when I, I first met with Jordan Cohen, maybe like three to four years into the business. And it was such a help. He's right here, right? He's, he's, right, he's, he's in Westlake. Yeah, we're in the Westlake, same, yeah. we're in the same market. Mm -hmm. I sat down with him and I respect him a lot. He's made, he's done great in business. He's a great guy. Great dude. But I realized like, he's a normal guy like us. Very normal. When I sat down with him, I thought it was going to be this like crazy out of body experience no. and he was going to have all this very charismatic no. guy, but he's I, a very humble guy. I realized sitting down with him, I'm like, this is just normal dude. I can do very this. Very normal. I can do this. Like if, if this normal guy can do this, like 
Why why would I not be able to? Direct mail. Yeah. He just does direct mail. Direct mail it's and, insane. Re- and relationships. Yeah, it's relationships. He's mastered relationships. Like, that's all the marketing he does is these masterful direct mail pieces. Yeah. And um, you know, has just built these incredible relationships with some of the <laughs> most incredible athletes and movie stars in the world. Yeah. Dude's an absolute animal. I just love him. But yeah. um, but you're right, he's just so down to earth. Um, just super cool. And, uh, he's the kind of guy like you can hang out with, Yeah, you know, you're like, I want to hang out with him. You know, like <laughs> some of these guys, you don't, <laughs> you don't really want to yeah. hang out with every time I answer the phone, I'm like Jordy, like mm-hmm. it's just, he's, he's, he's one of us. It's, it's cool. Another thing that, that, uh, that you said that has been kind of like sticking out to me is that, that parabolic growth yeah, or, or, um, whatever the curve is called. Slight edge, man. It's just exponential. Yeah. Like I'm, and it, it's scary and, and it happens in levels and it doesn't ever stop happening throughout your life. Right now I'm in the middle of basically this new kind of launch of wanting to become the largest real estate group in the United States. Mm. And I'm in the middle, totally possible. I'm in the middle of hearing people say, Oh, like that, you know, that's not going to happen. Oh, it, 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 that's it, it, crazy. It's, e- it's easily possible. Like it, it, it's so easy. It, 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 it's, it's, it will make you sick to your stomach. It's such an, it's so easy, right? The fundamentals of what you're wanting to do is so simple. Um, it's so easy to execute. The problem is, um, you know, actually executing it. it again, this is a 10 year commitment. Yeah. It's a decade. You know, deal. Yeah. And, and it's a full-time commitment. I mean, running a, running a organization is a full-time job. You know, the problem people have with teams are they, they're a full-time real estate agent. And then they're like, Oh, the next progression is build a team. Okay. Well, they had a full-time job as an agent helping people buy and sell real estate. And they don't realize that they're adding another full-time job to their day. Now they have two full-time jobs. They don't realize it, but most people think they can be a team leader just like on the side or like somehow it just magically, you know, being a team leader just magically happens with, I don't, I don't know what they think. I I thought the same thing. I tried to do a team twice. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for me, like I'm, I'm, I am a, you know, I grind, but everything I do is, is more on a passive basis so that I can sleep at night. Yeah. I don't like problems. I don't like uh, situations. I don't like lawsuits. I don't like all the stuff that comes with building out a true team, true company, et cetera. Um, But I've found ways to be part of organizations, make a lot of money and have equity in companies and organizations and stuff without actually being on the inside and dealing with all the negative aspects and of having risk. it, right? Yeah. And that's what's cool about today's world is you can do that. You don't have to go out and build a company of 100 uh, employees, you know, to make $20 million in today's world. You don't. Um, but back to what I was saying, it's so, what, what you want to do is, is so simple, but you're going to have, but it, it, when you say it, it sounds so crazy, yeah. right? It sounds so... To other ambitious. people, for yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah, when other people on the outside looking in, they hear, oh, I want to do this nationwide team and this organization, this real estate group. Um, people are just think like, because you have to realize, man, like 99% of people don't even realize what the opportunity is in today's world. Yeah. I mean, you, you, you like, I'm, I grew up in Alabama, right? But yet people know me all around the world now. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's not like I have a million followers. I have a couple hundred thousand followers um, and and literally building, you know, you know, eight figure, nine figure businesses. Um, you know, like it, it's it's crazy. And like back in the day before the opportunity that's right in front of our faces in the palm of our hands, you couldn't do that. No. You could not do what no. I'm doing now, you know, um, 20 years ago. Right. Even just 20 years ago, you could not do what I'm, I mean, I got in real estate in 2002. There was no Facebook. There was no social media at all. There was no Zillow. Um, you know, there, there was no auto dialers. There was no, like, it's insane. The opportunity that's right there in front of us nowadays. And 99% of people don't even know it. So when they hear, you know, something like this, they're stuck 20 years ago thinking that there's there's no way like they don't realize like i could do one post and like literally have enough agents 
to build your nationwide team. Like in a matter of 24 hours, I could have agents in every state lined up to apply to be on your team, mm -hmm. right? Um, people just don't, they don't. And, and, then, and then even when you say something like that, people don't believe that. Right. No, even though you could no. just be like, well, look this here it is. Yeah. Here's. Yeah. Um, so it, there's like the amount of haters in the world now, right. <laughs> is, crazy. is obnoxious. Yeah. Um, and you just have to use it as inspiration. I tell people all the time, you know what your ambitions are, you know, how hard you're going to work, right. You know how the story ends. Okay. Um, you know, you can't listen to other people. It's like I said, everybody always bets against me. And, but I know what I'm, what I'm capable of. I know how hard I'm going to work. I know that I'm not going to quit. I know that I'm going to outlast you. I'm going to outwork you. I already know all this mm -hmm. going in, right? I, I know that in five years, I'm going to look back and say, what happened to that guy that was talking smack? You know, like I'm yeah. still here crushing it. I'm, and I accomplished everything I said I wasn't going to do. Where'd that guy go? Yeah. See these guys that talk smack, they're not going to do anything. They're not going to, they're not going to achieve the stuff that we're going to achieve. You yeah. don't, you don't, you don't achieve anything talking smack about other people. And like you said, once you've done it three, four five times and you've, you've beat down what people thought was impossible. People still talk smack, man. Even what, at that point you have even more haters. Right? <laughs> That's so the, true. The bigger, so you, true. the bigger you get, the more you, the more you got. Yeah. Right? It never goes yeah. away. And you just, you just accumulate new haters and new ones and new ones and new ones, you know, and the more, the longer you do it, you know, the more you have. And, you know, sometimes it'll like in the beginning stages, it bothers you a little bit, you know, and then you become numb to it. It's, it's stages, right? You've got the bothersome stage, you become a little numb to it, and then you get to where you laugh at it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. 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 Cause you realize what it is. Yeah. And without, with building the team and, bringing on like a full-time social media manager. What I didn't understand before I went like kind of full-time with social media and, and starting to build out the framework is that you are exactly right. It's literally, I have two other full-time jobs now. Mm. I have my sales business. Yeah. I have social media and I have building out the framework for the team. My workload tripled yeah. in the matter of three weeks. Right. And it's just, day in day out working through exhaustion yeah. and, and working through doubt and just and, and, continuing and to move most the people don't have the infrastructure you have and so you know they're just like a single agent with an assistant i'm going to build a team so they start bringing on agents right thinking that's going to like escalate their business or make it to work can scale and stuff like that and it, it becomes a thing where they have more expenses and less time to do stuff and so what happens is they spend time building the team and it takes time to build up a team to where it's profitable. And then it takes time away from their business, their, their sales, right? Mm -hmm. So now they're losing money on their sales because they're spending time on a business that's losing money. Yeah. Right? <laughs> this is like this thing. It's okay? very hard to manage. It's very tough. And people don't realize it going in kind of what it, it, what it actually is in reality. Um, you know, and that's kind of the problem with it. And we talked about this. The other part of the problem is attrition. Agents that come in, they're coming into the team because they want to learn what they have to learn to go do it on their own. Most people don't join a team saying, I want to be on the team forever and give up half my money mm -hmm. forever. Mm -hmm. That's not what, that's not their goal. Their goal is to learn what they can so that they can go out and be their own agent, you know, and go out and do it on their own, be a great single agent, a mega single agent, number one in the market, maybe build their own team, whatever. Um, and, and, but the teams, you know, that's the agent's goal, right? Is to learn and leave. Yeah. The team's goal is, is to retain them forever. So the team's goal for the agent and the agent's goal for the agent is not the they same 99% of, of the time, yeah. which creates that. That's where this whole thing breaks down is that there's two different goals happening here and we're not on the same page. There's really not a whole lot of transparency behind it. And, uh, you know, it kind of ends ugly. And, 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 and so the team creates, you know, this is traditional. This is just the general teams creates a situation where this agent becomes dependent on the team for admin, marketing, and lead gen, right? They don't, they don't teach them how to lead gen. They don't teach them how to do marketing to get the leads or, or to, to market or build brand. And mm -hmm. they don't teach them how to write contracts and stuff. They, mm -hmm. they take care of all that for them. They give them all the shit leads, hoping that they call a bunch, sell a bunch of you know, show a bunch of property and, and sell some stuff so that the team makes revenue. 
And so, so the agent came there to learn how to be their own agent, but they're not learning anything because yeah. they're not learning how to write contracts, do marketing or get leads. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. They're learning some sales skills on the phone. Yeah. They're learning how to go shop property and stuff like that. But that's such a small part of what you got to know to go be your own agent. So when they leave the team a year or two down the line, they're really starting from where they were two years ago pretty much to learn the stuff. And then the team makes them feel like shit for leaving the team. Yeah. Can't believe you're going to leave after all I've done for you and all this stuff. Um, it's, it's a really wild, uh, situation that, that, that I see out there. So I think if teams kind of more so went to a model where it was designed to teach the agents what they needed to do to go on on their own if they want to stay at the team forever if you want, or I'll teach you everything. I'll teach you everything. And if you want to leave, great. You know, that, mm -hmm. you know, my it's model, my model is set up where I retain you either way. Yeah. And then the ones that stay forever, because there are those that want to stay forever. Yeah. They're, they're comfortable. They're satisfied. They're not ambitious. They, they want that cushion of, you know, all the stuff that you provide and they just want to go show some properties and, you know, make a hundred thousand a year. Awesome. Um, you know, but I think if teams would go toward more towards that route and have, you know, a model that wins either way yeah. regardless of what the agent does yeah um yeah it's it, that's why i never liked i was never on a team you know i just went i was just an agent right i just want to go be a real estate agent mm -hmm. <laughs> i don't want to mm -hmm. be a buyer agent i want to show property i don't want to give people half my money yeah right i just want to go be a real estate agent yeah and so i just went and i just became a real estate agent day mm -hmm. one mm -hmm. and just learned everything um so i was never on a team and, uh, and I don't do a team. I didn't never did a team. Cause I was like, I don't want to take 50% of somebody's money. Yeah. I didn't feel right mm -hmm. doing that. Mm -hmm. Number one. Um, and number two, I didn't want to kind of be in that position where, um, I'm making somebody dependent on me. I'm increasing my expenses. I'm taking time away from my business. Yeah. Like it, it didn't make sense to me at all. That, yeah. The whole thing. Now there's these guys that have built these massive teams and they build them to a point where they can sell that asset as a team. God bless them for, for doing that. Right. You know, the process that they went through and all the hell that they went through to build a team up to that point, you know, that guy, Mark Spain and down in the Southeast, he did like 8,000 transactions a couple years ago, wow. their expansion team in a bunch of different States and stuff. And, uh, you know, it's kind of like they have, a they have this, brokerage within a brokerage kind of yeah. I mean, they're basically running their own you know entire company um you know and you know god bless them you know for, yeah. for that i think 99 percent of agents who do a team you know aren't at that capacity they're not they don't they don't even they can't even they don't even know why they're starting a team yeah. they're just like i got any buyer agent so i can make more money it's like you're gonna lose money and time 100 percent. yeah everything you said aligns exactly with the team structure that I see making sense, what we aim to do is to train people to become the top listing agents in their market yeah, and give them that ability to go out and close instead of feeding them really shitty leads, making them dependent. And then within the model that we're discussing, if, if they take their training after year and they go out on their own, God bless them. Like you said, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's like, you know, you still make a piece and everyone's yeah. happy and, right. um, and, and not taking 50%. I think yeah. it's a big piece charging people 20, 30% for yeah. that hands-on in-person or online coaching to help yeah. build them into that, that person. I think you're right. That's really the only way I see the model making sense. And I think scaling. it's cool because there've been a lot of brokerage models pop up to try to disrupt. Right. And I think like a team model that disrupts, you know, I, I haven't seen one that really like is like set up. We're going to go nationwide. This is how we're going to do it. This is our value proposition around disrupting the team model. This is the value we're going to provide. This is how it's all going to lay out. I haven't really seen that. It may exist, but I think it's really cool that, you know, and, you know, we can sit down and, you know, brainstorm some more on this, but coming up with some like a team model that's just disruptive completely right? disruptive it's disruptive people like don't understand a, it yeah, they're on like on a team model perspective not the brokerage but a team model perspective i think could really crush thanks dude i just i literally just lose sleep over it because i came up with this concept and it connects so well within my brain and the framework of everything that i've been able to make happen so far in my career that i'm like you know what let's just let's just do the ricky special and go all in on it mm. <laughs>
Yeah, yeah. So for me, it was like, I'm going to be the best agent ever, you know? And then in 2017, I'm like, okay, let me crush social media and become one of the top coaches, I guess, is what I would kind of classify myself as. Um, you know, now, which I, I crushed, you know, now I'm kind of like, okay, what's the next, what's, what's the, the next, next thing I want to like zero in on, you know, mm -hmm. I bought three acres. I'm going to build 46 units. I'm going to raise hundred percent funds to do it, um, down on the beach and Gulf shores. Um, you know, maybe developer Ricky is the next, uh, transformation. I could see that. You know, I would love to see that. Yeah, you know, it's gonna happen. I'm gonna build the build the units and everything. I just don't know where it's gonna go from there. Yeah, you know, um, but I'm excited to see and uh, kind of what the next chapter is. You know, for me, do you so, flip? Do you flip houses? Yeah, yeah. We uh we buy them on the courthouse. We fix them and flip them. I, I don't love it. Yeah, I don't I don't even like it um, <laughs> yeah. because you you take the money that you make and you pay taxes on it and it just I'm not crazy about it. Um. Like we've done about 150 flips in like, you know, I don't know, four or five years. And if we would have kept the best 30, oh my God, dude, we would be so much wealthier and have so much cash flow. Um, it'd be ridiculous, but we didn't, we flipped a bunch, we flipped them all. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what two other partners and one of them really loves to flip. That's his thing. Um, and I just don't want to ruin the relationship with those guys, you know, cause we do so much stuff together, but um, but I buy a lot of stuff and hold. I kind of do that on my own. Um, and that's what I love. That's what I love Because, man, too. I've made so much money. Yeah. You know, I'm like, I would buy something that's cash flowing 200 bucks a month, right? But, but like, that property has made me, like, 400 grand uh, in equity. In worth, and, like, yeah. now it's make now it's cash flowing, like, $2,000 a month. Yes. Right? Yes. And so, like, rent goes up. You know, values of property go up. I mean, it, it it's such a hedge against inflation. It's not even funny. <laughs> I right? just made an Instagram story about that literally 12 hours ago, yeah. right before you got here, is how putting your money into real estate is just your dollars. Real estate's not really going up. Your dollars are just going down in value. I mean, even and if it costs real estate than. just increased in value at the rate of inflation, it would be great. Great. You know, but it doesn't. It goes up higher than inflation. And, um, and rent, you know, rent continues to increase. So a lot of people, you know, down buying and holding and, you know, 200 bucks a month, isn't going to change your life. Well, if I flipped it for 40 G's, I'm paying 20 in taxes and that 20 grand didn't change my life either. Yeah. Right. Um, however, if I keep it for 10 years and I make 400 K on equity and, and at that point I'm making 2000 a month instead of 200. Right. Because I've paid some mortgage down. I've done this. Rents went up, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. OK, now 2000 a month and 400 K. Now that does change my life. Yeah. Right. Um, and yeah, I've done that for countless properties. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so it, it's I guess one reason I love buying and holding is because the experience I've had buying and holding has made me so much more money and it just continues to just pour money into my bank account every, yeah. every month. I'm like, you know, and I've flipped so many houses. And when I compare the two, I've made a lot more money on uh, the rentals. I bought a, let's, let's put it this way. I've bought maybe like not even half, probably like 30% maybe of the houses I've flipped. Okay. I've bought and held. So about 30% of the same number of houses I've flipped, I've bought and held. Okay. But I've made God, I don't know, 30, 40 times more money on the, a third of the properties that I flipped as I did on the properties I flipped. Yeah. Right. It's crazy. So again, it's the slight edge, right? It's that curve. Yeah. The first couple of years, you don't make a lot, but then after, right. That, and it hits that curve and boom, now it's just like, you're in the money. Yeah. And the only reason I have any kind of a net worth at all is from the properties that I held. Exactly. The flips, you spend the fucking you money the somehow. Money. Yeah, you're going to put it somewhere. It evaporates. Gonna... And then that passive cash flow, that's the only way that I'm able to eat a lease payment like this or to have like some amount of stability in my business. So for anybody that's watching this, if you are flipping or you're a real estate agent, you're hey, earning commissions. Awesome, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, if flipping is your um your main income source, yeah. just like making real estate. I mean, to me, real estate agent, being an agent, it's almost like being a flipper. 
You're taking it a property. It's exactly the same. Right? You're taking thing. a property. You're putting a contract on <laughs> yeah. it, right? And then when it sells, you make money. Yeah. It's basically the same thing. Yeah. So like if that's your and you're paying taxes on the money. So like if you're doing that as an agent or a flipper or a wholesaler, God bless you. Mm-hmm. Keep doing it. Build, build. You know, stack that bank. Do do your thing. Um, but use it as a catalyst. Know what the end goal is, though. Use it as a catalyst to make enough money to buy and hold some of these properties. You know, to actually build your worth. Ricky is a smart man, guys. Please listen to what he's saying. It's very powerful. Ricky, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. You are a wealth of knowledge. Thanks again. Thanks, Bo. Thanks for having me, man. Of course.